Hi, I'm Caroline Mitchell, canine behaviourist at Good Doggy. So if you've ever been confused by your dog's response to something, uh, maybe they've responded differently today to something they'd already done yesterday, or perhaps maybe your dog's brothers and sisters don't do this particular behaviour, um, or it's not normal for your breed, or other dogs you know don't do it, or maybe your dog just constantly chooses different responses. Maybe he's fine one minute, but then the next he's completely different. This can be frustrating because you might expect all dogs to behave the same, um, under the same circumstances, with the same things, but instead it looks like your dog has become really unpredictable. But there's more to it maybe than you might think. In this video, I'm gonna look at five main things that influence a dog's responses to a fixed situation, and we're gonna talk about what you can do about it. So the first thing I want to talk about is basically the way your dog feels at that exact moment, his current status. Um, this is a, how hungry he is, how tired, sore. Um, maybe he's had other experiences that day and he's still reading from them. Maybe he's a little bit stressed or maybe he's quite excitable. Perhaps he's been working hard and his willpower has been depleted from previous training sessions or maybe he's been at home alone all day long and he's not a dog that copes well with that. So that's been quite challenging for him. Our needs change how we prioritize things. So if your dog's feeling really hungry, um, he might do things he wouldn't normally do to get food. We're just the same. Um, if you're very, very hungry, you might consider stealing food if you didn't have any money. If you got hungry enough, that might be something you might consider. But when you're not very hungry, you know, you maybe just go to the shop and you see what's there, you buy what you can get. Um, when we're feeling lonely, we might go to quite extraordinary lengths to meet other people and satisfy that need. Um, so when our needs become overdue, the more overdue they become, the greater the length we will go to meet that need. And that need becomes prioritized over other things. During lockdown, we were all supposed to stay at home. We weren't allowed to go out and meet people at all. Um, but people went to quite large lengths to do that. They broke the law. Normal, law-abiding, lovely people um, were pushed that far because that need had become so overwhelming. They'd become so overdue and they needed to fulfill that and became more important than other things, their own values in that case. So your dog is the same. Um, so his needs are going to be changing all the day because everything is very, very fluid. You know, how much sleep he's had will change as the day goes on, how tired he is, how, um, how much willpower he still has, how much water he's had to drink, just generally how he feels. Maybe he feels a little bit sore. You know, he might be better in the morning, but not so much in the afternoon. So we really need to consider um, your dog's current needs um, and take steps to try and fulfill them if we can before um, you try and do any kind of training that is. So if you're working on a particular behavior problem and you know it's been a while since your dog has had anything to eat, it's been a while since they've had a nap, you know they're quite sore, um, there's other things going on, they've done some training, maybe now's not the best time, you're not gonna get the best out of your dog at this moment. Perhaps wait until later in the day when all of those needs are met, they're well rested, they're very content. Um, maybe um, your dog has problems with socializing with other dogs. When that need is really intense, you're gonna struggle to get things like a good recall or um, any kind of basic behavior because the need to socialize outweighs everything else. Um, so you'll see your dog will be in the park, they'll see another dog in the distance and they'll run straight to them and your recall all of a sudden means nothing. Whereas five minutes ago when that dog wasn't there and nobody was there, you're doing great recalls. So that need needs to be fulfilled. So socializing becomes a priority in that situation. So those needs change throughout the day and they become more or less prioritized as things go on. And that is one big influencer of how your dog makes decisions. Another one is the intensity of the situation itself. So if your dog maybe has um, a fear of something, the more emotional he gets, the more frightened he gets, then the, his behavior will change, it will become bigger. So I kind of think about a circle in the middle is um, a neutral state. So when your dog is in the middle of this emotional circle, they're very chilled, they're very content, they feel happy, um, they're not particularly feeling any big emotions in any direction. 
Um, but the further away you go from the middle of this circle, the more intense emotions become. And this applies to all emotions, um, excitement, fear, anxiety, joy, anger, frustration, all of them um, work the same way. So the further away from neutral you get, the bigger the emotion gets, the more intense the experience gets, and that then intensifies the emotion and so on. Eventually, you'll come away from that neutral circle and you'll cross over the threshold line. I did a video about thresholds, so check that out if you want some more information about that. But essentially, when your dog goes past the threshold, that emotion has now started to overwhelm them to a point where now they're no longer using their thinking brain, which is um, the brain that considers information, takes things in, makes plans, um, and they've flipped now into their instinctual brain. So when they're doing instinctive behaviors, they're not thinking things through, they're just doing um, what feels good. They're relying on previous um, experiences and things that have worked in the past. For example, if the doorbell rings and your dog doesn't care about the doorbell, his response will be fairly neutral. He might come up, follow you to the front door, see who's there, he might be interested, but his actual emotion level is gonna be really low. So that dog's now gonna greet your visitors in a really calm way, um, and they're gonna be great um, at letting people come through your door. If your dog is very triggered by the doorbell, if it makes him very excited or very anxious, then that behavior response will escalate from neutral, it'll get bigger and bigger until it crosses over that threshold line. And at that point then your dog may be jumping up, they might be grabbing at sleeves, um, they might be barking, they're running around, they're getting under people's feet and things like that. Lots of that kind of behavior is happening. So that's how that behavior is escalated. Joy can happen the same way. Maybe the door has made him joyous and that's what's made him escalate to this point. Fear, all of those behavior, all of those emotions, all are affected in the same way. But you can see that behavior is, has grown and it's gone over threshold now. So now you're asking your dog at the front door to sit or to stop barking or move away. Any kind of well-known command or cue that you give your dog at this point, he's not listening to you. He's relying purely on his instincts and he's just doing what feels good in that moment. So he's not making any plans, he's not thinking what would be a better option, what would be a more appropriate way to behave at the front door. He's just reacting. When we take those emotions a little bit further, further away from that neutral circle in the middle, we've gone past neutral, we've escalated now past the threshold line. And when you head towards the very edge of that circle, now you're heading towards aggressive behavior. Aggressive behavior happens at the end of all of these emotions. So when a dog gets fearful, um, the behavior escalates, it goes beyond threshold and they start now reacting in a kind of self-defense kind of way. And if it continues to intensify, then that behavior becomes aggressive. So we can see how the emotion of a situation, the intensity of it can um, determine whereabouts on that scale your dog is going to be and that will then change how he responds to it. We can control the intensity of an emotion um, in some different ways, but Probably the most obvious one is to um, simplify the experience and distance is a good way to do that. So if your dog is reacting to the presence of another dog and that dog is really far away, his reaction will be much softer, much closer to neutral. When that dog gets closer, then his um, reaction, the emotion will grow, his reaction will grow, his behavior will grow. So he's gonna react very differently to a dog that's very far away to the way that he's reacting to a dog that's quite close. So if you're thinking that your dog sometimes can walk past the dog calmly without worrying about them, and sometimes they can't, consider whether this is a possibility. How close is that other dog to your dog? Making space might reduce that emotion and help you um, work with your dog better and more successfully. If a dog is running very, very fast near your dog, or if there are lots of dogs, um, that can increase that intensity. So that changes things again. This is not just a calm dog looking off into the distance, wandering about. A dog that's running really fast um, intensifies the dog's emotion, your dog's emotion, what they're feeling, and that changes their response to that situation. So you can um, use proximity, your space, you can manage that to help make the situation easier for your dog to cope with, it keeps those emotions nice and low, keeping them below that threshold line so the brain is still on and they're still listening to you, they'll still do their recall, they'll still set. Distance might be quite far, um, but don't be afraid of that. If that's what it is, that's what it is. So that's how you can um, reduce the intensity and get a more consistent behavior that way. Um, if it's a noise-based thing, you can try muffling the sound. If it's um, a sight, you could try obscuring the thing that you're, you're looking at. 
Um, if it's the doorbell, just ringing it over and over and over again can help desensitize the dog because um, it starts to become meaningless when they hear it a lot. That's quite an intense amount of work to do though. You're not just gonna ring your doorbell four or five times a day. You need to be ringing it over and over and over again. Um, but there's lots of different things that you can do. But if you want to um, make your dog's behavior less affected by emotion, then trying to control that experience um, will really help. And talking of experiences, previous experience is really influential um, on a dog's decision about what they're going to do um, this time. So if the situation has occurred before or something very similar to it has happened before, then your dog will have expectations about what's going to happen next. Um, he'll know that if he tries certain behaviours, um, what types of outcomes um, he might expect from that. And he knows what kind of outcome suits his goals. Last time the same situation happened, he might have done this, which made him feel good. If that's the case, then it's very likely to be repeated. So he'll remember those experiences he's had before and he'll start um, referring to those results um, when the situation happens again. The less he needs to think about something, the more it becomes instinctive. I just said about going past the threshold line. When you go over threshold, you're relying on instinctive behavior. So experience is really important. If an experience has repeated itself a few times with the same results each time, then your dog will not spend any time trying to consider what to do next. He will allow that instinctive behavior to just happen. So he'll choose something that he's done in the past. There'll be no thought about it. He'll just do it. This is important for us. It feels like these kinds of, this instinctive brain and this thinking brain um, might be a bit kind of, um, awkward sometimes and maybe the um, instinctive brain isn't really helping us but it's not there for um, our modern lives it, it keeps us safe from danger it means we don't try and consider responses in a dangerous situation when you see something happening that's dangerous you don't want to be thinking should I run faster should I go this way or that way by the time you've gone through all these thought processes it's too late in a dangerous situation whatever is happening has happened if you're being chased by something it will have caught you um, so thinking in dangerous situations and emergency situations is pointless that's why we have this threshold line when the dog gets pushed over it they rely on their instinctive behavior so instinctive behavior happens when the result the expectation is the same every single time when a dog can rely on doing a behavior and getting the same result we can use this to our advantage, of course, because when we practice a behavior often enough, then we make that behavior instinctive. So if our dog does go over threshold, then they're referring to the behavior we've taught them rather than the behavior that they've learned themselves. So that's really important. So we've talked about things feeling good. Also, in an emergency situation, your dog is going to be doing what makes him feel the safest. Feeling safe is a primal need. This means that it's right at the bottom of the pyramid. So it will almost always be prioritized amongst everything else. There's not much that is more important than feeling safe. So if your dog is feeling unsafe in a situation, then he is going to do what makes him feel safest. Again, this is all tied in with your proximity of something, the intensity, what's happened before. All of these things will change your dog's response in this exact moment. When your dog does something that successfully keeps him safe, and that will be from his perspective, if he thinks he's kept himself safe, he even gets a little reward for that. His body injects him with a little bit of happiness just to make sure that he um, knows that that was a good thing. When it comes to safety, some behaviors that our dogs do might look a little bit counterproductive. Um, so for example, um, if your dog's afraid of a dog in the park, if you get too close, he might start barking at that other dog. Um, and you might be worried that your dog's behavior of barking at that other dog actually could start a fight. And if he was trying to keep himself safe, um, he wouldn't try and bark at that other dog. He wouldn't be aggressive in that kind of way. But actually what will happen is, um, when he barks at something that he's scared of, but then he goes on to survive unscathed. So after the event, the dog will have gone away. He stopped barking. Everybody's calmed down. He'll have a little kind of check of himself. He'll check you, check everything else and go, well, look, everybody survived. So therefore barking really worked. Barking kept me safe. I barked at that dog, nothing bad happened. So it's good. And we see this every day with the postman. 
The postman comes to the house, the dog barks at the postman, and if this happens regularly enough, your dog really feels that barking is actually a really effective behavior because it scares the postman away every single day. Without fail, that postman, I will put money, has never been into your house, has never come in and petted your dog and been nice to your dog. He's never proven your dog wrong. Your dog has perceived danger, he's done an action, the danger went away, he feels better, he gets that little shot of happiness, which is a reward and he will just keep on doing it. He's no reason to not, that would be stupid. Why would he risk the postman coming into your house if he can just bark at him and he'll go away? Your dog has no idea that that postman's gonna go away anyway. And in the park, when he's barking at the other dog, he has no idea that the owners are gonna take their dog away eventually, or you're gonna be taken away eventually. And on that, you might even feel like that barking was a counterproductive behavior and wouldn't it have been better to do something different? Well, when we go back to that emotional scale, it's quite likely your dog did try and do something different. Maybe not today, but once. Maybe once when you walked to the park, he saw a dog and he was really scared and he backed away. And I see this has happened quite a lot. Lots of people will do this, especially when they're young puppies. They'll take the lead and they drag their dog forward towards the other dog and they go, it's okay, he's friendly and then you reach out to pet the other dog to prove to your puppy that that dog is fine. On that day, your dog learned that pulling away didn't work. He might have tried other things as well. He might have tried um, maybe some kind of um, avoidance behaviors towards the other dog. Maybe he tried not to look at that other dog. Maybe he um, became quite stiff and warned the other dog to go away. The other dog couldn't go away because he was on his lead as well. So when we talked about that emotional escalation, at the very start of that fear, the behavior was different, but so often we ignore that and we push past it because we think we're doing a good thing for our dogs. We think we're teaching them that everything's okay and we're not, we're teaching them that fear will be ignored. So what they have to do then, we get them closer and closer, that emotion escalates and then that behavior becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until we end up with a dog that's barking and lunging and crying in the park at a dog that's um, not too far away from them. So we can see how that's changed. If that happens often enough, then it becomes an expectation. So that plays into our expectations as well. Again, if that dog was really far away, you would see a completely different response if your dog had never um, experienced another fear reaction with the dog before, it would have been a different response. So we're gonna go on to the last and fifth thing that will affect the way that your dog behaves um, and the way he chooses his reaction to a thing. And that is your behavior. So the way you react to things will definitely change the situation too. So when you've started training your dog, so let's go back to the, the reactive dog because this is a problem lots of people have. You've started a training plan and you've got your treats in your pocket and you've got your marker word or you've got your clicker ready. Um, you've made some space, you've kept your dog onto the outside, you're doing all of the right things and you've approached that situation properly ready. You're clicking away, giving loads of reassurance to your dog. You're showing them they're doing the right thing. You make loads of space, you walk past, your dog gets his treat and it's all fabulous. Your dog will be the best version of himself in that situation. If though you walk into the park and you're not ready, your clicker's in your pocket, you don't have your treat bag open yet, you didn't bring any scissors so you can't get that open and you know maybe you're just not in a great mood today either, your patience is kind of short, perhaps you just don't feel well um, and you're stressed. So you're walking to that park with a totally different attitude, you're very unprepared, the situation presents itself, it comes at you faster than you can do anything about it and the next thing you know that dog has come into your space, you weren't clicking, you weren't ready, you weren't reassuring your dog, you weren't making space, and now your dog is gonna behave really differently because he was relying on you to do all those things to help him. Even simple things like how you hold the lead or how you ask for cues can make a big difference. If you are short of patience and you're tired and you're grumpy and you are really quite assertive in the way that you speak to your dog, your dog might not be used to you being that way, and maybe finds that a little bit jarring. Maybe they're used to you using a more softer tone. The way you hold your lead, if you're stressed or tired, you might hold it shorter um, or longer than usual. Simple things like that can make a big difference. The amount of space, if your dog has a very long lead and they see something they're afraid of, then they can swing backwards and forwards. That can escalate an emotion really fast. Having them nice and close means that they can't do that. 
But if you suddenly change something that they're not used to, then again, that will be quite different and quite jarring. Other people will have a big impact too. If you're walking in the park and you're trying to do some work with your dog, trying to help them stay calm and not lunge at other people, and everybody in the park that day is just really busy and don't care about what you're doing, they don't even look at your dog, you're just gonna have a great day out after training. He's gonna be really responsive to you. He's gonna see that other people are not paying him any attention. He's gonna get loads of rewards and your training is gonna move forward. So your dog will be behaving differently that day to the next day or the next person you meet, even on the same walk, who suddenly goes, oh, Barney, you're my best friend, and comes down on the floor and grabs them and hugs them and lets them jump all over them. In the meantime, you're trying to wrestle them away and you're saying, no, don't let him do that. I'm trying to teach him not to. And they're saying, oh, no, it's fine. So there's two different people you met in the park have really affected the way your dog has reacted. Your dog approached one, they didn't even look at him. They were very busy. They were looking at their phone. They were walking differently. The second one, looked straight at Barney and smiled and invited him into their space really fast. So he, completely different responses will change his behavior each time. So how do we fix all of this stuff? So we see there's a lot that goes into this decision-making process. So given all of the different factors, other people's behavior changes, your behavior changes, how intense the behavior, the emotion might be, his own personal status, which you won't have much of a clue about because you can't feel what he's feeling. You don't know if he's hungry or if he's grumpy or if he's really chilled out. You can only see what's on the outside and do your best to judge that. So maybe given all of these things, it's perhaps not fair to expect consistency from your dog at all. We had the same dog in the same situation so here in the morning, your dog hears the doorbell. He feels particularly insecure. He's tired. He hasn't had his breakfast yet. You're stressed because you got up late. Um, he was right by the door when the doorbell went off. So he heard it really loudly. It really startled him. So on that exact scenario, his response is going to be so different to if it was in the afternoon, he's got a full breakfast. You've got all the time in the world because the kids are at school. You're not worried about anything. All your jobs are done. You know somebody was coming, so you got your clicker and your treats ready. And instead of the doorbell ringing, maybe this time you'll volunteer because you took control of the situation, gently knocks on the door. His response will be so different and the outcome will be different because you'll be able to reward him for the behavior that you want. He didn't escalate up that emotional scale too far. So he stayed under threshold. You were able to do work with him. We can see the difference between those two situations and a lot of that you're not always going to be in control of. So knowing what um, affects him most means you can at least try to overcome some of those things. So I mentioned just now getting a volunteer, telling them exactly what you want them to do, exactly how you want them to behave, what you want them to look at, how you want them to knock the doorbell, if you want them to ignore your dog or whatever, then that can be really helpful. Knowing what makes an experience more or less intense for your dog means that you can manage that in the early stages as well. When you're working at a very low level of emotion, your dog's more likely to succeed. So you'll be able to reward them. You'll get more consistent results from your dog. Also knowing that people are pretty um, unreliable. Um, you might ask somebody to push your dog away whenever they jump on them, or you might ask them to ignore them, or you might ask them to turn away. If this isn't a volunteer that you can trust to do this how you want, then you should expect very mixed results because some people will be happy to push your dog away. Some people might be very happy to push your dog away and might do it in quite an aggressive way that you actually don't really like. Other people might be really kind of weird about that. They might not like that at all and they might feel a bit strange. Perhaps it's a stranger that doesn't really like dogs at all and they're now waving their hands around in the air, which isn't helping because your dog will now start to jump around and try and grab at the hands because they think that's playing. Um, maybe some people will ignore your dog um, by turning their back on them and folding their arms or maybe they'll try to ignore your dog by leaning down and looking them right in the face and saying, I'm really sorry, but I'm not allowed to talk to you, which isn't very good ignoring. <laughs> So relying on people that you don't know really opens you up to um, a mixed bag of results. So you need to take control of that. Don't allow your dog to go towards people until you've experimented and you've practiced on people that can do the same thing. Once his expectations change because his experience of meeting people will overwhelmingly be with the people that you've set up for him. So his expectation of getting attention when he's jumping up will get lower and lower and lower each time you do this. 
eventually its expectation of getting attention will be really low that you can start to practice on random people in the street because actually it won't matter then because he's already um his experience tells him that when he sees a person in front of him he has to be calm and he has to sit in front of them and only then will he get attention because if he doesn't do that he will get ignored or whatever it is that you're doing in your training so changing those expectations using volunteers that you can control helps make a consistent training environment makes his behavior consistent when everything else is consistent he will be much more consistent too when you know uh, what kind of things affect your dog's general kind of state of play his general condition his needs um, then you can start to control those as well if you think your dog has a very high social need then find ways to help him socialize freely in his own way before you try and do any training with him if you know he's going to run out of willpower after 20 minutes of training then make sure you use that training really well do the things that you really want to do if you know he doesn't cope very well being at home alone then don't try and do training with him after he's been at home all day long while you've been at work you know he hasn't been coping all day um, and that's just going to really affect his mood when you take him out later on. If he's had lots of stressful experiences, then maybe um, you're working on some reactive behavior or something like that. And it didn't go very well and it's just um, stacked and stacked. Or maybe he's very excitable because excitement stacks in just the same way. Frustration does too. So when he's had lots of experiences and they've all stacked on top of each other, each time you, you meet that similar situation, his behavior will change. His response to it will be changed because his willpower has changed and his tolerance has changed and his stress levels have changed and his anxiety levels have changed. So find ways to take him completely away. Give him rest, plenty of rest. If you can find something that's quite meditative, so sniffing in long grass can help or go home and just have a nap and try again later. Those things can be really good for resetting when emotions stack on top of each other and you need to just really get back to, back to basics again. Once your training starts to take effect, these things will have less impact. And really, that is um, the same for all of this stuff. All of these things that we've talked about, the how he feels when you go out to training, your behavior, um, the scale of emotions, and the intensity of the experiences, other people's reactions, all of these things will change. Um, as time goes on, the better he gets at performing a behavior, the less these things will affect him. So these things will affect you most at the start of your training um, journey. Um, and as you go through your training journey, his expectations will change. He gets better at things and everything else starts to take less effect. So one further thought just on that. We talked earlier about instinctive behavior. Um, and how when your dog goes across threshold, then they rely on their instinctive behaviors. You can make any behavior um, that you want instinctive. So when people teach their dog something new, let's say, for example, you would like your dog to sit in front of a, um, a person when they're meeting them in the street. You might get some treats out. You might get a person to come towards you. You might get your dog to sit. You might give them the treat. And that might work really well. You might do a couple of minutes of repeat of that. And then you'll think, right, we've taught that. It is done. We can tick that box. My dog now knows how to sit in front of strangers. At the very start, he needs you to be there to tell him what to do. He needs you to be prepared. He needs your volunteer to come and be consistent. He needs to be all of those other things um, need to be not affecting him, his willpower, his tiredness, his hunger, any of that kind of stuff. We need to get this all perfect and he will do that. If you drill that over and over and over again, don't accept that he knows how to do it. Keep practicing it. Practice it every day. Practice it for five minutes every single day. Then this behavior, he'll become so good at it that it goes into that instinctive part of his brain. So then when he does get over threshold, that's the instinctive behavior he will refer to. His expectations up until that point tell him jump up for the best results. His emotion has gone above threshold, so he's not thinking through whether that's the best option or not. He's just doing it. When we make this an instinctive behavior and he goes over threshold, his instinctive behavior now is sit. I must sit. If I don't sit, I won't get what I want. The sitting is the thing that gives me the best results. But this often goes wrong because people will quit too quickly. They go, we've taught that and that's it. When we think about anything else, 
Think about footballers. We don't teach a team of footballers how to do a corner and say, we've taught them. We make them practice it over and over and over and over and over again. Every train session, they will be doing that and they will be training over and over again because the more they do it, the more instinctive this comes. We don't want footballers on a pitch trying to remember how to do a corner. We don't want them thinking, where will my fellow team players be when I kick this ball? They must know where they're going to be because they do know because they've practiced it. So they don't need to think about any of that stuff. Everything happens much faster and it all goes brilliantly. Musicians don't just learn how to play a song and declare themselves a genius musician. They practice it over and over and over again because the more they practice, the less they have to think about how they play. When they first start to play, they'll play slowly, bit by bit, and as they get better and better and better, the fingers will just start to play the music and their brain is not involved anymore. When you drill behaviors like that with your dog, when you practice and train and train and train, these new things become instinctive behavior. So if your dog trainer tells you the reason your dog is not doing what you want is because you haven't practiced enough, that's what they're indicating. That's what they're saying to you is that, you know, your dog does know how to do it, but knowing isn't enough. It has to become an instinctive behavior that they can do no matter what. So be consistent yourself. Get volunteers to improve consistency. Make sure that your dog is in his best possible frame of mind when you go out. Keep those emotions low. Make sure you've got plenty of space so that your dog is not being overwhelmed by an experience that's getting too big. And you will start to see your dog's behavior becoming more and more consistent over time. And then you'll start to see behavior change in a kind of more linear way rather than what you're probably experiencing, which feels really chaotic and up and down. One day we're good, the next day we're not. And there doesn't seem to be any explanation, but there will be one. It will just be in one of those things. Hopefully that's helped. Um, let me know in the comments what you think and I will speak to you on the next video. Take care for now. Bye bye.